morning, Your Holiness. Uh, so wonderful to see you, Your Holiness. I hope uh, you're feeling well and uh, all is good. We miss you. We miss seeing you in person. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Your Holiness, it's been 20 years since our meeting in Dharamsala uh, on destructive emotions. And that was a meeting that uh, we uh, feel changed the field uh, of science in which we work. And you gave us uh, many inspiring suggestions and you uh, requested certain kinds of investigation. And there has been much progress over the last 20 years. Before that time, Your Holiness, uh, there was no investigation of the effects of mind training on emotion. And today there are literally hundreds of scientific studies that have been focused on the effects of mind training on different aspects of emotion. And we can trace that to this Mind and Life meeting uh, in 2000 in Dharamsala. And yet there's still so much we don't know, as you often remind us, Your Holiness, when it comes to Western psychology and neuroscience, our understanding of the mind is very small. Uh, so we have many questions. So uh, I will begin this evening and ask Your Holiness, uh, in Western psychology, and in neuroscience, we use the term well-being, which means genuine happiness. Genuine happiness has been described in different ways, although there is a lack of agreement on what the key factors are that make up genuine happiness. And so the question that we have is, Your Holiness, what are the key elements of genuine happiness? Happiness, uh, very much so related with our uh, emotion, uh, part of emotion. Uh, so the emotion, there are many causes, uh, all the environment, external things also uh, uh, effect, but mainly our own mental state. Mental state, calm, peace, the surrounding difficult sort of situation doesn't matter, not much disturb. So mind is uh, very, very important. Uh, and then one good thing is mind can train uh, through training those destructive emotions try to reduce. Uh, constructive emotion can increase. Positive emotion very much based on reason. Negative emotion just the emotion, no reason. So long run, you see, through training, uh, you see, our mind can, emotion can change. All those destructive emotion can uh, reduce. Uh, finally, can eliminate uh, the positive emotion such as uh, the, 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 the Sanskrit word karuna, compassion. You see, we can develop infinite way. Some scientists say that be, we are social animal. So any social animal is some kind of, by nature, uh, you see, the society at the group uh, is 
basis of your own life. So therefore, any social animal, some kind of sense of concern of their own group. So we human being, social animal, uh, obviously from birth, you see, our life entirely depend on mother's affection and family affection. So we all, by nature, since, you see, uh, our own sort of also the life very much depend on uh, your own group. So you have to take serious concern about the group which your life entirely depend. Looking from that way, we should be more compassionate. Uh, compassion should not consider something religious thing. Is it related with the society, the humanity, like that? Uh, thank you for that beautiful teaching. When uh, you've used the term destructive emotions in what you've said, when we first had this meeting 20 years ago, you yourself requested specifically that we talk about destructive emotions. When psychologists think of what makes an emotion destructive, they say it's when it lead someone to harm themselves or another person. In the meeting, though, uh, another standard came up. It was emotion was destructive when it distorts our perception or disturbs our peace of mind. Your Holiness, my question for you is, what do you think makes an emotion destructive? Karsa. Uh, no more destructive says your one destructive emotions. Never exchange no more said. That's so what they get any never exchange higher the Yule Chinjolo to Tongue Chane Sungiore, the Yule Chinjolo to Tonga, and the Susu Semke, she did the Toba Chek Tone, Gomba Shigiona, Yanko, and Yong Sorti Kyo, and you got a queer Chelelia, and she had a never chair, the Rangle never check, Chaki Yungu, and that and destructive said Ilia. Characterization of a particular state of mind as a destructive or constructive really has to be understood in relation to our basic disposition of a sentient creature. And it's not something just we human beings have, but all sentient beings have this natural as this, you know, uh, the drive to seek happiness and wanting to avoid suffering. So any, anything that leads to, uh, that is contrary to this disposition can be characterized as destructive in a broad sense. And, and when it comes to our disposition of wanting to be happy and not wanting to suffer, this is something that we don't have to logically prove. It's a fundamental fact of a sentient creature, not just us, even uh, animals, and particularly this, you know, social creatures. Um, and we know, for example, like many of the more constructive states of mind are related to our social nature because they, they have to do with more, uh, you know, harmonious relationship with the, so your social members of the social group. So in human relationship also, we see many of those states of mind that tend to be more constructive are the ones that promote that kind of relationship and social life. So that's one really uh, way of talking about this. And, and this also reminds me of um, my, my, you know, you know, my wish when I talk about these things to really couch them more in secular terms, secular universal terms than religious or Buddhist, specifically Buddhist terms. And, and the, the importance of that is then we will develop a language that will be more universal, that can be brought into the school setting and education system. And I really feel that this emphasis on appreciating the social nature of human beings and what are the specific constructive states of mind and qualities that can be important for living a so good social, happy life really should be introduced from a very small age. 
uh, so that they become part of an education curriculum. And I normally speak of emotional hygiene because everybody uh, takes care of their physical health and physical hygiene. So something like emotional hygiene really needs to be brought into the school system, education system. So, uh, and also as part of this, education um, should really include uh, bringing common sense in a very powerful way in, and demonstrating how the destructive aspects of these, some of these emotions can manifest and destroy relationship. There's a beautiful uh, lines, uh, in uh, extolling the virtues of patience and forbearance, he gives uh, the uh, example of how when it's opposite, like a anger and hatred uh, takes over, you know, how physical behavior and it changes. And he talks about how, you know, when ang strong anger arises, even your face assumes an ugly demeanor. So even though you might have prepared yourself to go out and looking really good, but if you're angry, your angry face with the frown and everything makes you look ugly and un unappealing. And even if you force yourself to smile when that, you know, when you are angry, the smile comes out as pretend, you know, some, some form of a pretense or a sarcastic, sarcastic smile. So, and then of course, you know, anger immediately destroys uh, friendship and relationship and so on. And patience and forbearance sometimes may be more challenging because, you know, sometimes adopting patience and forbearance involves putting up with certain hardships. But the payoff is really great because those who are able to bring patience and forbearance and, you know, rooted in compassion, they have a greater sense of ease. They have more joy. They are more fun to be with. People like being around them. So those are really you know, common sense. Of course, Chandide, uh, Chantakriti is talking in a Buddhist text, but these are really common sense. And these really need to be part of the secular education, promoting uh, the values of these constructive emotions. So another important Another important fact that uh, Chantakriti uh, brings out is how when anger arises, it really robs us of our ability to be discerning. So because it really takes away that, you know, the, uh, the sort of the cognitive ability to discern what is the right action to take in a given situation. And, and so this, and so th what this suggests is that is among the various emotions, anger is the one that has the most destabilizing and disturbing effect. You know, attachment from the Buddhist point of view is seen as belonging to a more destructive quality of emotion. But if you compare attachment to anger, attachment does not disturb us that, as that, that much as anger does. Anger really shakes us from our equilibrium. So I think this, this fact of how anger robs us of our ability to be discerning is again an important uh, attribute that needs to be reminded, you know, we need to reflect upon, yeah. Yeah, these are uh, extremely interesting and important issues for uh, us to consider. And this notion that anger robs us of discernment uh, is, I think, very um, uh, important to bring to modern scientific investigation. Uh, 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 and so this is extremely helpful, Your Holiness. I'd like to ask a question now that's a little different. Uh, there are programs that train people to act in a compassionate way. For example, training people to volunteer to tutor children in schools. There are programs like this in many different parts of the world. But they, these programs do not help to train the mind of these volunteers. There are other approaches that train the mind, but do not teach people to apply this training in the world. So my question is, is there a balance 
a, a, a proper balance, a, a best balance between these approaches. In, in the Tibetan and Buddhist uh, language, we speak of the three doors of our action, the body, speech, and mind. And these are the three avenues through which we interact and engage with the world. But out of these three, the most important one is really the mind. Because you know, if we are able to transform the mind, if we are able to bring really a conviction in the value of compassion, empathy, concern for others, and at the level of changing the mindset you know, of, of the child, then action of helping behavior, uh, restraining from harmful words and harsh words, and ha trying to harm others, these restraints will come naturally. Uh, so I, I think that so between the three, the speech, body, speech, and mind, the emphasis really has to be uh, on the mind, on the mental level. And in any case, when we are talking about bringing the education of the heart, we are talking about the qualities of the heart, like loving kindness, empathy, affection, kindness, and so on. So here already we are talking about you know uh, qualities of the mind, and th those qualities of the mind has to be cultivated with an approach that prioritizes a mental training. So uh, if we look at the three doors of our action, uh, body, speech, and mind, um, well the, at the level of body, uh, of course, we can imagine or understand certain types of bodily action, which is completely neutral morally neutral action and that may not require even in conscious intention something that just body kind of you know a mechanical motion of the body but compared to body speech is way more sophisticated because human speech uh, if we compare to the speech of animals the birds they sing a lot but we can see that you know when when there is a danger there's you know issue sounds that are particular kind. When they are trying to attract mates, they are issuing sounds in a particular way. So there are some variations which are important part of their life, but compared to human repertoire of speech, the animal's speech is actually quite limited. But humans have such rich repertoire of speech that even though if we are trying to hurt someone, even though we may not use harsh words, and the words that we are using sound good, but we may we can say things in a way that it, that really hurts someone, you know, in a sort of a, in an innuendo or some kind of implicit manner. So human speech is very sophisticated. So therefore, uh, for practitioners particularly, uh, paying attention to your speech, being mindful of your speech, is considered very important because that is an important part of a social life. Now, compared to speech, the mind, the mental world, is even more complicated and complex. And in any case, um, both speech and um, body, bodily action, both of them, those that matter, morally significant actions of speech as well as physical action, really are coming from a state of mind, an intention or a motivation. So I think when we talk about bringing compassion and kindness in a school curriculum, I think the emphasis really has to be at the level of mind, intention, and motivation. Uh, so, and, and so, for example, if we have the intention of compassion, then you know, we will naturally choose words that is more constructive, that is more beneficial, that's less hurtful. So, that, so, so the intention and the motivation really defines the, 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 the constructive or destructive nature of the action and of both speech and body. You know, this is uh, really enormously informative, Your Holiness, and uh, uh, we, I think, need to pay more attention to uh, combining mind training with, uh, uh, with action in the programs that have been developed in education in the West. Uh, and so that's uh, very, very helpful. So thank you. Dan? Yes, I, I'd add that, uh, Your Holiness, you've, in talking about uh, 
an education of the heart, you've often made a, a, a what I think is an incisive critique, which is that modern education, secular education, focuses on the material world, but does very little with our inner mind, our inner life. Uh, and for example, compassion is missing from the curriculum. And if you think about emotional hygiene, which is a term that you've used, how that could apply. I have a question for you about anger. You, you included anger as a destructive emotion, but anger comes, you know, I'm thinking of Gandhi or Martin Luther King. They're angry at social injustice, but they use their anger. Can you, can you tell us about how uh, we can have what you might call a constructive anger? That the social injustice, right. or, 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 so, um, so this example of um, anger in the context of confronting injustice, uh, societal injustice, um, but I would argue that actually one could confront these injustices um, quite effectively without anger, without resorting to anger, by using compassion. Uh, and also because many of the acts of injustice are really coming from a place of either ignorance or you know be falling uh, victim to uh, destructive emotions or very discriminatory you know sort of you know biased attitudes on the part of the perpetrators you know whose understanding of you know fellow human beings are lacking or wanting so there's ample ground to really feel compassion for them and also, uh, in, a, in, in some ways, one could say that to save them from you know, further consequences of creating destruction. So for example, in the case of Tibetans, you know, we are fully cognizant of the injustices that is taking place back home in Tibet. Uh, you know, yet at the same time, uh, we are trying to carry a, a struggle where we strive to ensure that we never lose sight of the humanity of the other side, always remembering the humanity of the other side. And, and whatever criticism or whatever resistance we offer, it is being you know, offered from a place of wanting to be helpful to both sides. So clearly, yes, anger can be a powerful motivating factor, but one can also bring compassion as a powerful lens and motivating factor in dealing with injustice. Thank you. Your Holiness, models of, in psychology of genuine happiness often leave out morality, ethics. So my question is, what is the relationship between ethics and genuine happiness? Ethics ethics so when we are talking about ethics, actually we are talking about, you know, our relationship with others. Um, and ethics, you know, in a, in a nutshell or in a very basic level, uh, is an action that involves res refraining from harming others and, if possible, being helpful to others. So that, in a sense, is the central question of ethics. So if we take our understanding of ethics to be that way, then we can see the connection with happiness. Because as social creatures, um, you know, if we engage in actions that are harmful to others, not only does it bring harm to other, you know, other fellow human beings, but also it undermines one's, the basis for one's own well-being, one's own happiness. So whereas if we are bringing uh, a sense of understanding, empathy, and compassion for others, consideration of others' needs and well-being in our interaction and relationship with others. Not only does it help others, but it also helps ourselves. So one could argue that you can use a self-referential argument, self-referential case, to promote ethics from the perspective of personal well-being or personal happiness. So in this way, we can see a close connection between ethics and living an ethical life and, you know, living a happy 
a genuinely happy life. Pesi do stem in a destructive emotion to the monk shady. So, and also one distinction, important distinction that we can uh, appreciate between positive versus destructive emotions is that in the case of destructive emotions, generally they tend to be much more impulsive, instinctual, you know, reactive. Uh, you know, if something triggers, we react. Uh, and, and they are not really grounded in any considerate response, engagement with whatever the situation is. Whereas if you look at more positive and constructive emotions like uh, compassion, and empathy, and love, and so on, then although they may arise naturally, but in fact, we can see that they can be grounded in reason, understanding of reality, and then they can be strengthened. So they tend to go more in tune with reality, whereas destructive emotions tend to be more reactive, instinctual, and not much basis you know, of, of consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness. Your Holiness, uh, this, this brings to mind uh, the work that Paul Ekman did on the Atlas of Emotions. I, I know you encouraged, actually, I think you even supported his work on mapping the full range of human emotion, the anger family, the sadness family, the joy family, and so on. Why? Why do you think it might be helpful for us to understand the full range of human emotion? That's my question. But the reason why, um, you know, I was, um, you know, I felt it was important is that uh, partly uh, in given that the mind science is quite a new field in contemporary science. Uh, perhaps there is still a lot of scope and room for development of the and refinement of the constructs and the concepts. So because for example the word emotion is quite used liberally and the, the, because we use the word emotion liberally people seem to get the idea of some kind of monolithic uh, sort of world which is called emotion and everything is lumped in there. Whereas if you look at the Buddhist approach to understanding the mechanics of the mind, if you want, uh, for example, in, in Abhidharma uh, psychology, uh, if you, there is a whole classification of known as mental factors. These are the, the modalities functionally defined in which ways in which the mind engages with the world. So there, for example, in one of the influential Abhidharma system, there's a list of 51 such mental factors. And within these mental factors, if you look at them, they are not only clearly defined, but their functions are identified. Their interrelationship with other mental factors are identified. Their behavioral ex expressions are identified. So there is a much more systematic approach, whereas if you compare that to the Western mind science, there doesn't seem to be a comparable systematic approach. So my hope was that when creating emotional atlas or emotion map, then we will be able to get using the contemporary psychology science, scientific language to fine tune and come up with more differentiated way of understanding the human mind. And one of the in, you know, interests that I have is for someone or a group of people to look at the Abhidharma list, 30, 51 factors, and try to really uh, do a research and tease out to see you know, by using Western terminology and cat classification like emotion to see how many of those 51 can be put in the emotion camp and how many of them will not belong to that category. So those are work that could be interesting, you know, that needs to be done. Thank you. Your Holiness, I, I'm, we're sensitive to the time and if we can, we'd like to ask two more questions. Uh, one is, one of the ways that scientists study emotion today is to take advantage of the fact that we all have these, these phones that we carry around. And uh, uh, scientists have texted people and asked them many times a day for many days, how are you feeling right now, right at this moment? And they report the emotions that they're feeling. 
And so the question that we have for you, Your Holiness, is what are the emotions that predominate, that are more frequent in a person who exhibits genuine happiness? And a related question is, Your Holiness, if you might, can you talk about what emotions you experience yourself on a daily basis, mostly? What are the most common emotions? So the one basic fact um, is really, again, once again, it has to do with our social nature, when we, even when we're talking about uh, dominance of emotions uh, in our life. Um, you know, we know from uh, some scientific studies that um, uh, the state of mother's mind uh, has an impact on the unborn child. And uh, so, it, uh, so the impact of others' uh, affection or emotion or state of mind, on, you know, becomes crucial right from a very early stage. And we know, for example, when the child is born, the first few months or years, nurturing relationship really lays the foundation for the emotional life of the child. So there, and, and from there, um, you know, it really establishes the basis for the role of compassion, the role of love uh, in our life. And so not only at the beginning of our birth, but also uh, in, in middle life, as well as towards the end of our life, the role of compassion and love and affection remains very powerful. And we know that, for example, when we are the recipient of someone's affection, they are loving people around us, we feel more at ease, we feel more assured, we feel rested, um, you know, uh, uh, secure. So, uh, and then we know that even from, for example, if a loving person is, a uh, loved one is dying, and then the loved one is surrounded by truly loved ones who genuinely love this person, the dying person is able to let go and pass this life more easily with at ease. On the other hand, if this is a person who hasn't been that nice towards others, and then at the in a time of death, maybe there are family members who are fighting about the inheritance uh, and, you know, sort of with each other, and imagine the impact this will have on the mind of this dying person. So even when we are dying, uh, others' affection, others' love matters to us. So that is really the foundation of our, our emotional life as a social creature. Um, so therefore, making that emphasis and creating that kind of experience of affection, receiving affection, giving affection in our life is really the way to build a, a good, a rich emotional, constructive emotional life. So this is when on this point there is no difference at all between religion and no religion, different religions. It's really we are talking about the fundamental human condition, the you know, the facts of human reality, facts of human existence. So even uh, in a classroom, uh, when a formal subject is being taught, um, if the teacher shows kindness and a genuine sense of concern for the child's education and the children feel secure in that classroom, the, the lesson they learn goes deeper. They actually pay attention. Whereas if the teacher may be uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, knowledge-wise very competent, but if the person, teacher is not bringing human affection in the classroom and do not make that connection with the students, and then instead you know, it creates a kind of a fearful atmosphere in the classroom, then the, this fearful state of mind prevents children from actually learning. So this is, you know, something that we can see from our own personal experience. So for example, if, if there is a teacher who is popular, who is kind and who is gentle and, in, you know, engaging, the children love going to that classroom. Whereas if the teacher is someone who is stern, cold, and in fact short-tempered, 
uh, and loses temper you know easily then children instead of looking forward to going to the classroom the moment they have to go to that class they feel as if the sun has set <laughs> so so that's the you know a very natural human uh, you know attitude and response yeah there's actually good scientific research that is very consistent with this your holiness uh, so this is uh, really a wonderful description thank you one final question your holiness it's along these lines if we're social animals and if warmth and warm-heartedness is so important and if there are seven billion people on the planet given the oneness of humanity how can we make the leap from loving people we care about and know to loving everyone so here the, the important thing is, as we spoke about earlier, um, the compassion is a natural human quality. This is something that we are biologically given. Uh, so the ability to have a sense of concern for others' well-being is there as a part of our natural inheritance. And, and yes, you are right, generally we tend to reserve it for a small circle of people. But here, in when we are trying to expand the scope of this natural compassion, we need the aid of wisdom. And, and so here the wisdom, by wisdom what I mean is to really use our rational thinking. For example, understanding first of all that just like myself, everybody on this earth wishes to be happy, do not want suffering. And furthermore, to really appreciate that, you know, in this today's reality, the welfare and the interest of everybody is so intertwined. You know, there is no longer a real basis for making hard differentiations of east versus west or south versus north. Um, so the, the, the whole world is so intercon interconnected and interdependent. So the, if we are serious about our own welfare and our own co co community's well-being, we need to take serious concern about the well-being of others. So this deep interconnectedness of today's reality is something that needs to be brought by understanding and wisdom. And also to make to appreciate that in the past, situation may have been different because countries and small tribes and communities may have been able to remain autonomous. So in those kind of situations, maybe there is a case to be made for not caring about what goes beyond your border. But in today's world, those kind of situations have completely changed. So this, I think, is an important point. And furthermore, from our own personal, you know, from one's own personal well-being, the moment you are able to connect with someone at the basic human level, you know, a shared human level, the awareness that just like myself, this person too wishes to be happy, do not want suffering. If we bring that awareness, then you know, it really opens up a much more easy way of interacting with everybody. So in my own personal case, I had the privilege to travel extensively. And whenever I'm in a different place, different ethnic groups, different communities, different cultures, different languages, different religions, but I always relate first and foremost at the fundamental human level. You know, I know at that level, on that level, just as myself, this person in front of me wishes to be happy, do not want suffering. So if I'm able to relate at that level, there is a sense of ease, uh, you know, there is a naturalness. And I, uh, you know, I can you know, bring my best and bring the compassionate heart in that interaction. And the expression comes out in the form of a smiling, and humans smile towards other smiling human beings. That's a sort of a natural human response. So I think just using this kind of reasoning, this wisdom, uh, there's clearly, you know, it, there is a basis where the natural compassion can then be expanded to include so that when we begin to use the word we, that we will cover everybody on this earth. That, so that we, so our sense of we and us really should cover the entire 70 billion, uh, 7 billion human beings. Yeah. So now today, the uh, whole world is, as I mentioned earlier, east, west, north, south, all have to live together. So we 
should keep oneness of human being of this planet. Uh, we have to live together. So no longer f fight each other. Senseless. Occasionally some sort of uh, disagreement. Then through dialogue, you say, try to solve, not through weapon. So uh, thinking this line, you can really develop peaceful world, a demilitarized de world. That should be our aim. So we all uh, have common responsibility to build happy humanity on the basis of consider oneness of seven billion human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness. This is very beautiful, very profound, very helpful. On behalf of everyone, we want to thank you for taking the time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.